Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for all that you have in store for us. I thank you for just placing an expectancy and an excitement down on the each in the inside of each one of us so that it bubbles up, it bubbles out, it bubbles forth in joy and peace and excitement, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for this day that you have made. Yes, Lord. I prophesy ears to hear, eyes that see, and a heart that's open to receive all that you have today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I was thinking as we were all, as everybody was sharing the testimonies and, and what, you know, the beautiful messages that people had and songs and things, I was thinking, wow, I hope you guys don't mind be having a longer day here today because <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> Praise God. But no, I was, it was a blessing to hear everybody's testimony and what you had to share. So I'm expectant. I'm excited. The title of my message is Be Expectant. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And I'm going to do a, a really quick synopsis, a little history lesson. It's funny because we talked about history and the importance of history this morning in Sunday school. So I'm going to do a, a real brief uh, history lesson. And, and my husband's actually the history buff in our family, but sometimes I, I delve a little bit into it too. But did you know that the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament is often referred to as the intertestamental period. Have you ever heard, heard that before? Or between the testaments. It's also known as the 400 silent years. As the last prophet that was heard was Malachi, which was around 400 BC. And then all the way up until AD 25 when John the Baptist comes on the scene as the forerunner to the long-awaited Messiah. And during this period of time, that 400 years, there was a lot of changes in the political, religious, and social atmosphere. A lot of highs, a lot of lows, upheavals, wars. For a time, Israel was under Persian rulership. And then it was under Greek rulership. And Alexander the Great, you may have heard of him, and leadership under the Greeks changed when Alexander the Great died and Antiochus Epiphanes took charge. And he over overthrew the rightful line of the priesthood and desecrated the temple, defiling it with unclean animals and a pagan altar. This led to the Maccabean revolt, which was a tumultuous time of war, violence, and infighting. In 63 BC, Pompey of Rome conquered Israel, putting all Judea under the control of the Caesars, which led to King Herod's rule. This leadership heavily taxed and controlled the Jews. So much took place during those 400 years that it's just too much to even share. But in the years leading up to Jesus coming on the scene, it was, it was like this snowball effect uh, in that the Jews and pagans alike were profoundly and negatively impacted by the religious, social, and political oppression. And life just kept getting harder and harder for the average Jewish person as the tension was building. And not just around the taxation and the the, the Roman uh, oppression, but the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees held grippling religious, or crippling religious um, expectations, and they had the wealth and the power, and the people prayed and hoped for relief. And all of this unrest and oppression set the stage perfectly for the long-awaited Messiah to come on the scene. The stage was set. And you can just imagine under that great pressure, the prayers that people prayed, the longing, the desire, anticipation of salvation and freedom. Similar to today, right? We can kind of relate to that, can't we? 
And the 400 years of silence were broken when John the Baptist proclaiming in Matthew 3, 2 that the kingdom of God is at hand. The 400 years of silence were broken by the greatest story ever told, Jesus. Let's look at Luke 3.15. Luke 3.15. This was John was preaching to the people. And in verse 15 it says, Now as the people were in expectation... And all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. And down in the Helps for 3.15, it says, John's prophetic ministry stirred the messianic hopes of the people. The Passion Translation for this scripture says, During those days, everyone was gripped with messianic expectations, believing the Messiah could come at any moment, and many began to wonder if John might be the Christ. Hallelujah. And verse 16 says, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to choose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people, but Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, that he shut John up in prison. I'd say we've reached a time in history where things have snowballed and the stage is set for God's hand to move mightily again. The political, religious, and social climate has reached a point where we are all crying out and expecting a shift, a divine intervention, a miracle. We are all experiencing the pressure in our world, our nation, our state, on our streets, in our backyard, right here, in our personal lives and situations, but God. I heard this past week that in one translation of this scripture, verse 15, where it talks about the people being in expectation, it says, this one translation says, the people were on their tiptoes in expectation. Expectation. And you can get that visual, can't you? I like this description, being on your tiptoes in anticipation, because I stand on my tiptoes a lot, don't I? <laughs> but that's mostly because I'm short and I need to see things and I need to reach things. <laughs> Expectancy is deeply intertwined with faith. It refers to the eager anticipation or hopeful belief in something yet to come. I read that it is a mindset that drives individuals to anticipate and await what they believe will happen based on their faith and knowledge of God's promises. And I think we throw around these words kind of loosely, you know, faith and hope and, and expectant, being expectant, without really considering how powerful they actually are, and what they really mean scripturally. The word hope is also intertwined with expectancy and faith. It's the word elpis, and it's hope, not in the sense of optimistic outlook or wishful thinking without any foundation, but in the sense of confident expectation based on solid certainty. That's hope. It's not some optimistic outlook, which I think that's the way it gets used a lot. But scripturally, that's not what it is. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation based on solid certainty. I'm going to turn to Hebrews 11. I 
I'm going to read 1 through 7. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Hallelujah. And I'm going to read the helps down below for verse 1. It says, The author supports his encouragement to steadfast faith by reviewing the triumphant experiences of Hebrew heroes. First, he provides not a definition but a description of how faith works. Faith is established conviction concerning things unseen and settled expectation of future reward. The Greek word translated substance literally means a standing under and was used in the technical sense of title deed. The root idea is that of standing under the claim to the property to support its validity. Those, thus faith is the title deed of things hoped for. Throughout the chapter, the writer emphasizes that assurance rests on God's promises. Hallelujah. Settled expectation of the promises of God. That, that settled expectation, it's a mindset. It's a lifestyle that we must cultivate. The helps for verse 6 says, Nothing so pleases God as a steadfast faith in all that he has promised to do. Hallelujah. That's a lifestyle. A lifestyle of earnest, eager, tiptoe expectation and anticipation that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. Are you expectant? Are you expectant? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We had a word from the Lord a couple of weeks ago during worship where he encouraged us to be expectant. Many of you were here. He said, be expectant. If the Lord says something, he means it. Listen. Listen to him. Expectancy in the Lord is much more than just a desire to see something. It's standing on your tiptoes in anticipation for what you are expecting to happen. It's knowing, knowing that it's going to happen. And the excitement of it is so intense that joy and gladness just bubble out of our being. Expectancy should be a lifestyle. No matter how long something takes, don't ever give up hope. I love what Joyce Meyer, I was listening to her this, this week about expectancy, and she was talking about getting out of bed in the morning, and you, jo Joyce Meyer's kind of funny, she, she kind of acts funny sometimes, and she was talking about getting out of, the, out of bed and saying, oh, Lord, I'm old. And then she stretches uh, uh, and creaks her back, you know. And then she says, you know what helps me when I'm expecting something good to happen today? I'm expecting God to show up and show out. I'm expecting somebody to be healed physically today. While I'm preaching the word, I'm expecting salvation. I'm expecting to be bless, a blessing to somebody today. I am full of expectancy. And she said, you know what happens when I do that? I start getting excited. I start to get enthusiastic. It literally energizes you. 
The King James Version of 1 Samuel 36 says, And David was greatly distressed, because the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But the people were speaking of stoning him. Can you imagine being in that situation? But he encouraged himself in the Lord. In the following verses, it says that David sought the Lord for his next move because if you know a little bit about these, these verses, the Amalekites in retaliation had just invaded David and their, their, uh, you know, their, their dwelling and taken the woman and children hostage. And in verse 8 of these scriptures, it says, The Lord answers David's question. When David went to the Lord, he sought the Lord after encouraging himself. And he asked the Lord, What should I do? And the Lord said, Go ahead and pursue them, for you shall overtake them and without fail recover all. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Say all. All All the promises of God are yes and amen. In his word to us, he promises to return to us all the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm have stolen away. Zechariah 9.12 says, Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I actually want to turn there. It's Zechariah 9, if you want to go there. Zechariah 9.12. And I'm going to read it again. He says, Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prisoners of hope. What does that mean? It refers to an embattled people, warriors who were standing and believing and anticipating victory because they knew who was on their side. God was on their side. Who's on our side? If God before me, Who can be against me? And the helps for the rest of the verses here in this passage, I'm just going to read it because it's, it's pertinent. These verses describe a warring, victorious people whom their Lord prizes as being like the jewels of a crown. I want to be known like that, the jewels of a crown. The lesson for the people of God under the new covenant is that God delights in a people who will engage in spiritual warfare and he will exhibit them as a banner of victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Engage in spiritual warfare. That's praise, that's prayer, and that certainly is expectancy. Hallelujah. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. How do we go to the enemy's camp and take it back? Prayer, praise, expectation. Hallelujah. Be expectant. All the promises of God are yes and amen. What has he promised? What has he promised you personally? What has he promised his people? What does his word say? It's full of promises. Hallelujah. I'm expectant that Jonah will be healed and come forth and be all that God created him to be. How do I encourage myself after 22 years? Because there are hard moments that I contend with unbelief. I remind it. This is what I do. I remind myself what he said, his promise. He promised, Jonah, you are a mighty man of God, a man of power, strength, and integrity, a man that will walk in the ways of your God and speak the oracles of God. And I remember what he's done for me and others. I stir myself. I encourage myself. What, look at, at what you've done for me. Look what you've done for them. Look what you've done, Lord. And I look at scripture. In fact, one of my favorite scriptures to look back at when I'm, when I'm in that place is I go back and I read about the man at the gate, beautiful, who was lame from his mother's womb. A man who was lame from his mother's womb. And he was healed. Hallelujah. And he went up praising and glorifying God, running and leaping and jumping. Hallelujah. 
I pray, I praise, and I stand expectant. Hallelujah. In that expectancy, there is rest because I don't have to figure it out. I try sometimes, but I don't have to look at any of the circumstances or situations all around me and imagine how or when God is going to do it. His ways are not my ways, and he knows the exact way, the perfect way, and the perfect timing for everything, for all things that concern you and I. The Jewish people that I mentioned in the beginning who were expectant for the Messiah, a Savior, they waited a long time. And they had their own ideas about what that looked like. They didn't understand exactly what he was here to do, what salvation looked like. I'm actually going to read uh, Kingdom Dynamics here, if, you, if you're with me in this Bible, for 9-9, Zechariah 9-9, where he, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. It says, This is the prophecy of the Lord's triumphal entry. In this verse, we see again how much God's ways differ from man's. Men look for a conquering king, high and exalted, to come and deliver Jerusalem with an army of mighty men. What they saw was a meek and lowly rabbi riding upon a donkey's colt and attended by a crowd of rejoicing peasants. He did not look like a conqueror, yet one week later he had risen from the dead, having conquered death and hell Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Moses knew and remained expectant that they would go to the promised land. He did not in his lifetime go into it, but it happened. And he knew that it would. He was expectant. He knew who God was. He knew what the promises of God were. He stood firm and, and steadfast in that. We have to leave every situation in God's hands. And, and here's the reason why. We cannot bear up under the weight of trying to figure it all out on our own, in our own strength. We cannot. I'm going to turn to John, 1 John 5. First John 5, I almost feel like my, does everybody can hear, still hear me? You can still hear me? Okay. All right, First John 5, four, started with verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Prayer is agreeing with God's will. Immature faith tries to manipulate God. It looks for spiritual shortcuts and formulas guaranteed to produce an answer to any request. It regards prayer as a weapon we use to force God to make good his promises. But true prayer is not a human effort at persuading God or forcing our will on him. True prayer is founded upon finding and coming into agreement with God's will. We ask according to his will, then we stand in faith, confident that God hears us and what we ask for is already ours. To pray with authority and receive answers to your prayers, make sure you ask according to the will of God. If you do not know his will, ask him. Believe that God hears your petition and has already set the answers into motion. Pray tenaciously, I love that word, and persistently until his will is accomplished. That is true prayer. Don't give up on the brink of a miracle. Hallelujah. David, in those were verses that I read earlier, went to God. He knew God was on his side, and he was expectant that his will would be accomplished. He knew it. It was a knowing. Tim Sheets said, he knows it in his knower. Hallelujah. When we pray fervently and with expectation, we partner with the Lord in the fulfillment of his promises in our lives and in the lives of those that we are praying for and the situations 
and circumstances that we are contending for. I was listening to a Charles Spurgeon message about expectancy and our prayers. They need to go hand in hand, remembering that it has to line up with his promises. We pray it with an expectancy, a tiptoe anticipation that God hears our prayers and will move in his perfect timing. I heard this once. If our prayers don't move us, how do we expect them to move God? Hallelujah. Let that just sink in for a minute. If our prayers don't move us, if we aren't moved in our prayer time with that tenacious spirit, how are they going to move God? Hallelujah. Spurgeon says, you must believe that God is and there is real commerce between your soul and God and that your pleading is a part of the divine way blessing you or else you are not praying but maundering and chattering. The Lord really does listen to the pleading of his people and though he does not alter his ordinances and his decree, yet in some way or other he makes the prayers of his people to be an efficient link in the machinery of his providence and grace. Dear friends, may the Lord, the Holy Spirit, stir us up to be instant in mighty, energetic prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know, I think so much of our time is wasted on going by our feelings, being tossed to and fro by our emotions, based on the situations and the circumstances, or the delay, or society, and the world around us, and by what Satan is doing. But the Lord wants us to rise up out of those ashes and live and move and have our entire being in Him and in anticipation, tiptoe anticipation and expectation of what He can and will do in all of it. In fact, living in that kind of mindset an expectation, waking up like Joyce Meyer said, expecting to see miracles, signs, and wonders every day, that's when he really moves on our behalf. Hallelujah. And on the behalf of our effective, fervent prayers and decrees and heart cries. Hallelujah. Think about all the times in Scripture when people pushed through crowds, through the unbelief of those around them, lifelong disabilities that seemed hopeless, threat of danger and death, and in great anticipation that a miracle was going to happen, not just might happen, but they knew was going to happen. Built the ark, lifted the staff, pressed through throngs of people to touch the hem of his garment, put the promised son on the sacrifice altar, fell at the feet of Jesus begging him to heal his dying daughter, ran at the giant with stones, a few stones and a slingshot. Hallelujah. Let's look at Matthew 8. I could go on and on. It's full. This book is full of people who knew who their God was and stood on his promises. So Matthew 8, starting with verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Caper, Capernaum, Capernaum, sorry, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, The Lord, my, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does, does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him, As surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's expectancy. Just speak the word. 
You have the authority to speak it, and it will be done. Hallelujah. That is what God is looking for from us. That kind of faith. I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can truly move when there is that kind of faith and expectancy. We have to push through doubt and unbelief. We have to push through hope deferred. We have to push through complacency and laziness and lack. We have to push through lack of energy, disappointment, discouragement, oppression, societal influences, depression, hindrances, preconceived ideas, religion, and live in expectancy every day. It needs to be a constant, diligent, reshifting, refocusing, encouraging ourselves. And after a while of doing that, it becomes quicker and easier to get there. It sounds exhausting, but actually just the opposite. It's just the opposite. The peace that surpasses all understanding. It's exhausting, though, to carry all those burdens. It's exhausting. That's what's exhausting. Let's look at Matthew. We're already in a Matthew. Turn over to... 11, starting with verse 28. I'm going to read to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. I am going to read the word for easy there. Hallelujah. The word denotes that which is useful, pleasant, good, comfortable, suitable, and serviceable. The legalistic religious system was a severe burden, but service to Jesus does not chafe because it is well-fitting and built on personal relationship with God by the indwelling Spirit. Hallelujah. When we focus on Him, and his promises in everything we face and in the ins and outs day to day with a hopeful, faith-filled, fervent expectancy, the burdens melt away. They melt away. Peace, joy, and excitement fill in, filled with a fullness. That's expectant. Why do, they, why do you think they call pregnant people, pregnant women, expectant? They're filled with the fullness, and they know what's coming forth. Hallelujah. Isaiah 40, 31, But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Other versions of this scripture use the word hope for wait. When you do a word study of that word wait, it is found in Strong 6960, and it literally means to bind together, collect, and expect. It's from the Hebrew word kava, and it means to wait, look, hope, and expect. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 2714 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. In the helps for this scripture, it says that these verses in this psalm start out as praise, turn to prayer, and then ends with a statement revealing the key to victorious living. Wait, that's hope. And remember what hope means. It's not just some optimism, hoping something's going to happen. It is a steadfast, earnest knowledge that it's going to happen. There's no doubt in my mind it's happening. Hallelujah. That prayer praise, and expectancy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The Passion Translation for Psalm 27, I'm going to read, says, Yahweh is my revelation light and the source of my salvation. I fear no one. I never turn back and run. For you, Yahweh, surround and protect me. When evil come, one comes to destroy me, they will be the ones who turn back. My heart will not fear. If an, even if an army rises to attack, I will not be shaken. Even if war is imminent, 
Here's the one thing I crave from Yahweh, the one thing I seek above all else. I want to live with him every moment in his house, beholding the marvelous beauty of Yahweh, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace. I want to contemplate in his temple. In the day of trouble, he will treasure me in his shelter under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock out of reach from all my enemies who surround me. Triumphant now, I'll bring my, him my offerings of praise, singing and shouting with ecstatic joy. Yes, I will praise, sing praises to Yahweh. Hear my cry, show me mercy and send the help I need. He, I heard your voice in my heart saying, come, seek my face. My inner being responded, Yahweh, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. So don't turn your face away from me. You're the God of my salvation. How can you reject your servant in anger? You've been my only hope. So don't forsake me now when I need you. My father and mother abandoned me, but you, Yahweh, took me in and made me yours. Now teach me, Yahweh, all about your ways and tell me what to do. Make it clear for me to understand, for I am surrounded by waiting enemies. Don't let them defeat me, Lord. You can't let me fall into their clutches. They keep accusing me of things I've done, breathing out violence against me. Yet I believe with all my heart that I will see again your goodness, Yahweh, in the land of life eternal. Here's what I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave and courageous and never lose hope. Yes, Keep on waiting, for he will never disappoint you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Living a life of expectancy in the Lord is a victorious lifestyle. In more ways than one, not only will he move in the situations and in the people that we're praying for, but we will live comfortably and peacefully in our inner man, energized and excited those are glory days. Hallelujah. So be expectant, saints of God. Wake up every day with a tiptoe expectancy. On your toes, expecting, waiting to see someone delivered and healed for perfect provision, guidance, fulfillment of prophetic words, miracles, signs, wonders, victory, breakthrough, restoration, salvation of lost souls, lives changed, people set free, pot prodigals coming home, 180 degree turnarounds, suddenlies, divine encounters, an outpouring of so many blessings we can't hold, divine protection, supernatural strength, personal healing, chains broken, salvation for America, Revival, reformation, shifting from left to righteousness in our nation and in the world, healing in our state and land, harvesting of a billion souls. I could go on and on. Hallelujah. What are you believing for? What are you expectant for? Believe, expect, it's going to happen. Not might, but will. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your holy name. Seal it to us, Lord. Seal your word to us, Lord, that we would live a lifestyle of expectancy every day, not just right now or every now and then, but every moment of every day that we would be energized on our tiptoes in anticipation and expectancy that your promises are yes and amen. And what we are believing for is coming to pass. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen.